Great. Well, welcome everybody to the 26th of July, 2022 Hyperledger Supply Chain and Trade Finance Special Interest Group session. Today, we're gonna to have uh, Dave Moynell from the International Chamber of Commerce talk with all about us, talk with us about uniform rules for digital trade transactions, what you see on the screen right there. Um, and we're glad to have them here. We, I guess since we're part of Hyperledger here, first off, we'll just go through the standard disclaimer, all are welcome, so glad that everyone's here. Also, antitrust provisions that please don't share anything that's competitive information or collusion or anything like that. This is an open session uh, for all of us to learn as well as uh, collaborate and have open questions and all those kind of wonderful things. So. Uh, this is Tom Klein. I'm one of the co-chairs of the special interest group. We also have on Eric Veliquet, who is based in Montreal, who's another one of our uh, co-chairs. And then Andrea Frosinini, who you see underneath Dave's uh, name there, is another one of our co-chairs. And depending on what day it is, he's either based in Vinci in Italy or Pisa or Florence. So basically Italy there. So with that, Dave has asked to uh, allow him to go through um, his presentation, have questions at the end. Please, if you have questions, maybe put them in chat and then we can use them as, you know, so you don't forget about them or have to save them. And then we can go through at the end. We'll go for till the top of the hour. And as I mentioned, we'll get this out uh, on so you can listen to the recording if you want to go back to something. So with that, Dave, it's all yours. Terrific. Thanks, Tom. And uh, thanks for inviting me to this. It's always welcome to get more information out in the market on the business of trade finance and what's happening in the uh, digital world. So let me move straight into the first slide. Um, we'll have the heading, digitalization is top of the agenda, most certainly in the trade world. Um, if we look at the different elements of financing, different things that go on around the world, trade finance has probably been the slowest over the previous decades in moving into a digital world. There's so much paper there, unfortunately. Um, but the circumstances uh, of the last two to three years now are forced to rethink in the trade finance arena. And it's really brought digitalization into focus as never before. In fact, I'd say we've, we've seen a progression that in normal times would have taken us about five years to reach. We're still at the early stages. But if you can see in this slide, the building blocks via numerous evolving technologies are in place. The challenge that we have is to digitally replace what is estimated by the ICC to be something like 4 billion documents that circulate in the trade system, 4 billion paper documents. I mean, that has to go digital, it's just obvious. It was highlighted at the G7 conference last year that digital technology is at the heart of building back better from the pandemic, and it will play a vital role and improving internet safety and transforming the economy. And one of the key interventions that was identified by the G7 Digital and Technology Minister's declaration is a greater adoption of electronic transferable records. I'm gonna come back to that quite a lot during this presentation. And the G7 members agreed to identify the legal and regulatory barriers which prevent the use of electronic transferable records by business to make economic savings and generate efficiencies in time security and data processing. Now, on this slide, you can see some of the new technologies that actually are enabling the, the uh, digitalization of trade and where they fit into the cycle uh, from pre-transaction to transaction processing to post-transaction. Uh, it's not one of my slides, you can see at the bottom is uh, produced by the World Economic Forum. And I find it to be a very useful picture actually in order to illuminate how and where certain technologies are already providing benefit. For instance, if you look at uh, DLC, the one in red at the bottom, being used to create smart letters of credit, uh, to enhance document examination, for real-time verification and reconciliation. Then you have the OCR near the top, the optical character recognition, enabling text recognition, checking for completeness of documents. Then we have the internet of things with the ease of tracking goods and documents and tracking document and goods locations. So there's a lot going on. Um, it has been going back to the G7 again. They mentioned last year that transferable records, uh, such as bills of lading, which are used very, very heavily in trade, are the most important commercial document in trade and trade finance. 
And yet currently, less than 1% of bills of lading are in electronic form. And some people have actually said it's less than 0.1%. So it's absolutely minute. This is a huge missed opportunity, given that electronic transferable records will make it easier, cheaper, faster and greener for companies to trade. It's going to bring global trade law into the 21st century, basically, by enabling businesses across the globe to move from paper-based to digital-based transactions when buying and selling internationally. And I purposely say 21st century, because one of the laws that uh, finance of international trade is based on is from the 19th century, the Bill of Exchange Act in the UK. So this really, as you can tell, really needs to change. Now, none of this will happen will never achieve these desired objectives if the regulatory environment remains static. And also be the legal side as well. Fortunately, that is far from the case. There are many initiatives in development at the moment. I'll briefly touch on the one on the top left, the ICC Digital Standards in Initiative in a short while. As you can see, there are many of us, such as ITFA, with digital negotiable instruments working in this area. We also have BAFT, who have a distributed ledger payment commitment which is a digital asset and global standard for a payment commitment that can be used on any blockchain network and can operate across networks. Now, what I really want to emphasize is the one in the top row, uh, which is uh, UNCITRAL. I mentioned earlier the ongoing work by the G7 on adoption of electronic transferable records. Uh, this work will, that is, leveraging upon the UNCITRAL model law on electronic transferable records transferable records, or MELITA, in short, as it's come to be known. And the scope of the G7 work is going to encompass all documents of tied to one transferable records relevant to international trade transactions. And this includes bills of lading, promissory notes, bills of exchange, checks, warehouse receipts, uh, insurance certificates, etc. And uh, the bottom line, the G7 countries have agreed to examine all legal barriers and regulatory and technical issues are currently impeding the adoption of electronic transferable records. What we are suddenly seeing in the market at the moment, it's the first time it's really happened. There's a convergence finally emerging between technology, between platform providers, market practice, law, and this National Chamber of Commerce rules. What this is doing is fighting what I call the inertia of tradition. So frequently when I talk, and it's especially banks, by the way, when we talk to banks uh, about international trade, they have done things in a certain way for decades. And many of them are very reluctant to change and see no reason to change. And that they're inertia of tradition. What has to happen is bringing in these new rules, new laws, et cetera, to force these people to stop this inertia, to start moving into a digital world. And there's three events here at the bottom of the screen that I've uh, highlighted that are helping this happen. Uh, five years ago in July, 2017, the UNSA trial model law that I talked about and electronic transferable records. This enables a legal use of such records, both domestically and across borders. Then three years back, the ICC produced two sets of ICC rules, the EUCP version 2.0, the EURC version 1.0, and these are supplements for electronic presentations under letters of credit and collections. And then last year, October, the the, the, the focus of this, uh, this uh, webinar, the ICC Uniforms for Digital Trade Transactions, which serves as the overarching framework for digital trade transactions. Then a background to the URDTT, as I've said, it came into force last year on the 1st of October. So it is still very much in its infancy. Uh, at the inception of the uh, drafting process, the drafting group was given a strict mandate to develop a higher level framework outlining obligations, rules, and standards for the digitalization of trade transactions. And this was and is the purpose of the rules. Now, this work is now being supplemented by a commercialization substream, which was established early last year. It's got cross-industry representation from all key trade regions. And this group is examining both the ICC e-rules and the URDTT, and it's developing a framework to evaluate the challenges and ideas to drive commercialization and adoption forward. There'll be a very comprehensive plan coming out later this year and recommendations on how we move forward. But in the meantime, there is already uh, an implementation guide to the URDTT that's been published. For those that are interested, 
This can be downloaded free of charge from the ICC website. And this guide details kind of various generic themes which need to be taken into account when we're utilizing the UIDTT. And includes the buyer and seller agreement, legal issues, which I'll touch on again later, technology requirements, and the usage and examination of electronic records. There's also a comprehensive section on the operational issues. And anyone who wants to use the UIDTT really does need to understand these in more depth. So as to the scope of the URDTT, they're entirely compatible with Lunacy Trial Model Laws, primarily Melita, which I mentioned earlier, and it's the foundation for the G7 work on the digitalization of trade. Any digital trade transaction subject to the URDTT must be digital only, no paper. All of RICC rules in our paper, these rules don't. We're only looking at it as a, as a digital world, but of significant importance is the basis of the rules in that they are not bank centric. Everything derives from the buyer and the seller agreement and of equal significance, the rules recognize that financial services providers these days are no longer restricted to just banks. Both of these issues are a very big departure from previous ICC rules, but they fit into the modern world in which we, we are now dealing. Uh, high level process, I mean, you're, you're all going to get this presentation, I guess, so you can spend some more time looking at it separately. But very briefly, it isn't a high level overview of the actual process. Um, a digital trade transaction is a representation of the underlying transaction. It is the process by which the terms, of the commercial contract between a seller and buyer are recorded and progressed. Intrinsically, a digital trade transaction is distinct from the commercial contract. A conditional payment obligation is incurred by a buyer upon, upon compliance by the seller in submitting electronic records to evidence the underlying sale and purchase of the goods or services. And an unconditional payment obligation is incurred by a buyer upon, upon compliance by the seller in submitting electronic records to evidence the actual delivery or receipt of these goods or services. A financial services provider can add a payment undertaking to a payment obligation at any time, even when it's conditional. And when it's added to a payment obligation, it's inseparable from that payment obligation. The payment obligation itself is always independent of the con commercial contracts. Um, and as the financial services provider payment undertaking is also added to that, the same applies. That is a very quick brief overview. I know it doesn't give you any time to assimilate the, contact, the content there, but at least it gives you a very quick picture. Uh, to go through it in depth needs a couple of hours, to be honest. So the key principles, what is a digital trade transaction? I mean, I've already touched on this. It's a process as agreed by the buyer and seller, whereby electronic records are used to evidence the underlying sale and purchase of goods or services and the incurring of a payment obligation. In order to be subject to the, uh, to the rules, a digital trade transaction must specifically state so, and it should satisfactorily reflect the underlying commercial contract, but it is separate. Uh, as a matter of course, and uh, in order to allow for the necessary examination process, it must also specify the terms and conditions by which compliance of an electronic record will be determined. Uh, considerations, um, the rules are binding on the buyer and seller. Uh, as long as they're not expressly modified or excluded, that can be done individually by, by both parties. The law, which I'm going to come back to, will be as specified in the terms and conditions of the digital trade transaction. Regarding platforms, there's lots of different platforms out there that can be used to uh, process digitally. That's to be agreed between a buyer and a seller. Uh, and it's also strongly recommended that the agreed format of the electronic record be stated within the terms and conditions of the trade transaction, because there are so many different formats out there still, many of which are not interoperable. And then compliance, which I've already touched on, is determined by electronic records submitted in accordance with the terms and conditions of the trade transaction. So what are the benefits? The URDTT allow for transactions in an electronic format. That's the key thing. And the changes in law that were derived from the UNCTRAL Melita's uh, uh, rules allow for possession of digital negotiable instruments. Possession's always been a stumbling block in the past, moving to a digital world. It's easy to evidence possession with a piece of paper, not so easy digital. And for this, the rules themselves are already ready. Uh, just a recap on digital trade instruments. These range from bills of exchange to promissory notes to bills of lading, 
and on occasion warehouse receipts. And all of these have free commonalities. Dave, hold on one second. Everyone can go on mute, please. Uh, we're hitting some extra noise. Please mute yourself. We're hearing everything. Hey, Tom, uh, if you're the host here, I think you can go on mute, uh, Michael. Ah, there we go. There's Michael. Mute. I got it now. There we go. Cool. Cool. As I mentioned about the digital trader instruments, they're, they're all irre irrevocable, they're unconditional, and they're autonomous to the underlying contracts. And these types of instruments fit perfectly within a framework of the URDTT because the URs are technology and platform agnostic. And they give a, a collective understanding of the terms and definitions, which of course by default leads to compatibility with existing rule books and uh, avoiding repetition. A quick word again on Melita. It's already been enacted in a few countries, including Bahrain, Singapore, Paraguay, and the UAE. And it's envisaged that the UK will introduce compatible legislation uh, later this year or early next year. And we expect lots of other G7 countries uh, to follow. Additionally, in view of the fact that many countries from the Commonwealth share a common legal history with the UK and English law, we could see a very quick uptake in these locations as well, which is something like 54 to 56 independent countries. Legal implications, uh, very quickly here, applicable law will always be as specified in the digital trade transaction itself. Uh, it supplements the choice of the applicable law agreed between the buyer and seller, as long as it's not prohibited by that law or in conflict with that, raw, that law. Uh, in the event that any person or per, per party would be prohibited by law, uh, they're not obligated to, do, to fulfill their obligations and assume no liability of responsibility. And should they require a different differing law to the uh, that stated in the trade transaction, this must be agreed separately. But one thing I want to say here, as with anything that we all do, law will always prevail over rules. But uh, as long as you can state a, a law, that will help. On the technology side, uh, I'm not going to go into this in any depth whatsoever. If you're interested in the technology for a data process, processing system, download the implementation guide for URDTT. But basically, Internal data processing systems need to handle the relevant formats for electronic records. They need to authenticate messages and they need to be able to execute electronic signatures. At the basic minimum, a data processing system should be able to process the data and maintain adequate standards. On the adoption side, various platforms have already stated their uh, intention to adopt and work with the URDTT. In fact, a few already are including it within their rule books. Uh, on this slide, you can see the commitment from the Marco Polo network to adopt URDTT terminology and scope. Uh, in this one here, uh, SDOCS, they've already incorporated the URDTT into their platform solutions. And then on the last one I have here, the further example is Contour, who are actively looking at developing trade products based upon the URDTT. And then very quickly, I'll just grab three or four examples here where there's public support out there in the market for the URDTT. For instance, ITFA, who are highlighting that URDTT will bring certainty to trade ecosystems. So exciting times and rules are ahead. A few, uh, three or four last slides there before we go into questions I, I want to highlight. The first is the G7, which I've mentioned a few times already. Now, in April last year, the G7 and various digital and technology trade ministers agreed to collaborate on electronic transferable records. And as a result of the technical discussions within the G7, together with Australia and the Rep Republic of Korea, they published a roadmap to reform. And this roadmap lays out the practical steps to reform to lead to greater adoption of electronic transferable records across the G7 and beyond. Uh, this should encourage greater adoption and use of electronic transferable records. Melita I've covered earlier, but just to repeat, it aims to enable the use of electronic transferable records, both domestically and across borders, by recognizing the legal validity of electronic transferable records that are functionally equivalent to their paper-based counterparts. Uh, two more here, the ICC Center for Digital Trade and Innovation. It's obvious that digitalization is going to enable us to deliver a more inclusive, 
sustainable and greener trading system where more SMEs can participate in trade. The trade is, finance becomes more accessible and paper is no longer required. Now, the Centre for Digital Trade and Innovation, or C4DCI for short, provides a unique opportunity to make this a reality. And it meets, um, it's in the UK, and it meets the UK government's ambition to have a modern open trading system with the rest of the world. And other nations and uh, regions such as Australia, uh, China, Germany, Japan, Netherlands, Singapore, Thailand, there's many more are moving also quickly to capitalise upon the benefits of digital trade. So this is an opportunity for the UK to develop the capability needed to be a model of best practice and work with others. The electronic trade documents, which I've mentioned on here, legislation, I've touched on this already, is actually underway in the UK to implement such a bill. Now, whilst this may look like a small piece of legislation from the outside, it's actually a game changer for world trade. Much of world trade is underpinned by English law. It's a legacy of the UK's historic role in trade, not just across the Commonwealth, but for every buyer, seller, uh, insurer, financier, or intermediary that uses English law as a basis for contract law or handling trade transactions and documents. The bill will actually have a, a disproportionately large and positive impact on global trade at a time when companies are looking to get their trade costs reduced. They're unsustainably high these days because of paper documents. And this was particularly so for SMEs and parts of the world where the cost of trade can be higher than the actual value of the trade. So industry can now finally start standardizing the digital trade system and start connecting the platforms. And last on the, uh, on the formal slides, this presentation is about the URDTT. I've also mentioned about electronic trade documents. The ICC UK has actually already released a paper on the URDTT and the electronic trade documents bill. And this examines how the ICC rules are compatible with the proposed legislative change in the UK with regards to the use of possessable electronic trade documents as set out in the recommendations of the Law Commission. This is also downloadable free of charge from the ICC UK website, if you guys want to have a look at it. And then finally, the ICC Digital Standards Initiative. Um, the idea of that is to establish a globally harmonized trade environment to address challenges and bridge trade digital standard gaps. And these include lack of coherent standards that, that we have at the moment, the legal uncertainty regarding the acceptance of digital trade documentation, the fact we have platform rule books that are hindering uh, chain, uh, document exchange and utilization, uh, unclear requirements for trade standards, and insufficient standards to simplify blockchain and non blockchain uh, based integration. So that's the, the uh, presentation itself. As I said earlier, Andrea already had some thoughts about some uh, questions. I'm sure we have some questions anyway, but uh, we should open the floor now. Great. Thanks, Dave, for uh, sharing that. And, uh... You're right, we'll be wanting to go through those charts uh, after this and dive in in more detail. So thanks for sharing the uh, charts. We'll get them out together with the uh, video for this recording of this. So there are a couple questions in the, uh, in the chat here. So the first question is from Michael Darden and he asks, how do ISO 8000 standards for portable quality data align with your work? Okay, now I'm no expert on that, but I am fully aware that the ICC commercialization subgroup I talked about is looking very closely at ISO standards. Now, the brief information I have at the moment is that there is nothing within ISO standards that conflicts with the URDTT. There is a compatibility there already. So I would hope that the, um, at some stage, that commercialization group I'm talking about will release a paper explaining that in more depth. But all I can say at this stage, they seem to be compatible. There's no conflict. No, yeah, that, that's always good. Uh, here. So next, uh, Chris McElvogue. Uh, so, hey, very interesting. All the countries, you mentioned Bahrain, you mentioned a lot of the Commonwealth kind of countries, UAE there. He asked, are you seeing a similar trend coming out of China, given the scale of their international trade? That's a great question, Chris. Um, yes, we are actually. Uh, in fact, we're seeing a lot of work coming out of, of China on this issue. They themselves are fully aware of the problems that would be faced if they also can't enter into a digital world. If I just talk about the ICC China, their national committee, they're spending a lot of time, they translated these uniform rules, 
They translated the guidelines and implementation guides that we've introduced, and they're working with all the banks and corporates in China to see how they can start implementing these. They've also, uh, they had their own different technology platforms over there. They have the same problems as the technology platforms around the world. In fact, they're almost like digital islands or silos. They know we have to get interoperable and work together. So yes, China are working very, very closely with the rest of the world in, uh, in, moving, forward, in moving forward on this. And I'm obviously very pleased to see that. And Dave, maybe, maybe if you could also comment, because I had a similar thought for the US audience, Canada, audience you know what, what's going on around here is it sounds like it's more commonwealth oriented if you're plugged into what's going on in the un then maybe you know about it but if there's if there's something specific it'd be interesting the, the us are actually have been very very proactive indeed uh bath for instance the, the banking association have done an enormous amount of work on there but very importantly i mentioned that uh we have melita this model law for instance trial going around the world slowly the UK next year and this year, sorry, introducing the Electronic Trade Documents Bill to be compatible with that. The US are also introducing, you have the um, commercial code, the Uniform Commercial Code in the States. That already from, the, now I don't know this in depth, but I understand that certain parts of the, uni, the Uniform Commercial Code are being adapted, or improved, changed, revised to ensure that electronic transferable records will be acceptable. That work is set to be completed later this year or, or early next year. So yes, the US is very, very much in the game. And in fact, quite a way ahead of many countries. Yeah, I'll press my luck here. So thanks for that. So, you know, Eric is representing Candor's probably a few others and any Canadian uh, specific stuff that you know about that's going on there? If not, no worries. Dave? No, not, not, I don't on Canada, not, not specifically, but uh, as I say, they're certainly going to be aware of what's happening in the US with the Uniform Commercial Code. They're going to be very aware of what's happening in the UK with the Electronic Document Trade Documents Bill. And uh, Canadian law, I think, is also has an underlying basis of English law, so it shouldn't be that difficult for them to take on the work from the Electronic Trade Documents Bill into Canada. There you go. Thank you. So questions are coming in. We'll consider Michael Darden came back with another question. Do you also consider an authoritative legal entity identifier, A-L-E-I? This is a brilliant question. This is actually key to the future. One of the problems that we have, or that banks have especially, is in onboarding clients, new customers, because they don't, and it's a very expensive time consuming business to onboard a new customer. Uh, but if we could have some kind of global identifier, a legal entity identifier, as is mentioned there by Michael, it's going to make the work a lot, lot easier. Now, work is going on everywhere, all around the world, in different governments and different institutions, such as the ICC, in pushing forward the, uh, the global legal entity identifier. The problem we are seeing so far is the take up is actually very, very tidy. We were hoping that the SMEs especially, who do the bulk of global trade, would start adopting legal entity identifiers. The problem is they've not been convinced. The market has not been able to convince SMEs of why they should do that. They'd be happy to do so if they could see the benefits. So some of the work that's being done by various organizations around the world at the moment is to find to, to, to highlight what the benefits are for a legal entity identifier. The fact is that will be one of the key issues when we're moving forward to uh, ensure that the SMEs can get involved in digital trade more easily because it will enable banks to onboard customers far more quickly. So yes, work, a lot of work is going on, um, but it's too slow because uh, the benefits haven't been explained properly yet. Wow. Yeah, I guess the question I'll add is kind of subsequent to that. Is GS1 involved in any of that work at all since they've kind of broken the code for at least from a barcode perspective in global trade? And <laughs> I, To be honest, Tom, I don't know. I actually okay. don't know the answer to that. Fair, fair enough. Okay, good. Yeah, that was also question. Alicia's question, by the way, if you look at the questions besides she's in, and, uh, and the list, it's pretty interesting because we guested a few weeks ago, a speech by GS1, Kevin Otto, if you remember. So this, this is an interesting topic. Yes, absolutely. And well, GS1 uh, has the uh, EPCIS standards that are used for object traceability and identification that are being used yeah. for traceability. So I'm wondering how these are compatible or if any thought was given to that? What I can say 
is that um, a few people did a lot of work last year on looking to see if the URDTT were compatible with laws, with standards, with developments that go ongoing all around the world. They couldn't find any clash anywhere. So as right. far as is known, in my mind anyway, the compatibility is there. I can't guarantee that they looked at this specific standard. I can't be certain. Okay, I, I can reach out to them then. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thanks, yeah, thanks, I, Dave, for uh, going wherever we're going here with questions. Let's go to the next one here from John Dunlop. You did not mention the edttworkspace.com as a URDTT platform. So I, I'm thinking John would like you to mention that edttworkspace.com. And maybe, John, uh, you could enlighten us if no one else knows what that is. Uh, yeah, the San Diego and Imperial District Export Council has sponsored a workspace based on the URDT for all exporters and importers to use free of charge that apply the rules. All the templates and all the business methods actually provide the URDT rules to the world. Yeah, John's absolutely right. And I, I need to update my presentation, John. You're right, <laughs> that should be on there. Uh, we're having great success with it, David, and thank you very much for all your work. Yeah, well, thank you. The work you've done is actually very comprehensive as well. So yeah, it's appreciated. Thank you. So, so uh, John, you get, get a chance here for a plug is uh, you go to edt, edttworkspace.com and you can learn all about what you're doing? Absolutely. It's, it's published. It's working right now and we're doing transactions with Kuwait, Italy, South Africa, China, and Indonesia with the rules. Yeah. Beautiful. So we got an implementation, another implementation out there. That's great. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Vahi, I don't see the rest of your name here in the chat. Um, for John, does it, or not John, for Dave, does it cover cross-border payments? Absolutely. Um, any kind of digital trade transaction, be it domestic or international, cross-border, whatever. Yes, 100%. And in fact, let's look at it. International trade is primarily cross-border anyway. Absolutely. <clears throat> Good deal. And, and folks, if, you know, if, there, if there's additional questions, you can either put them in the chat, you yeah. see what I'm doing here. Or sorry, you know, sorry Tom, just, just a couple of questions that I've been having in mind. You see, Dave, uh, Dave and I, we talk on a regular basis all over LinkedIn. We do participate to events in common. Dave, just my thought, you see, being a trade finance specialist for a long time, uh, I see the release now by the ICC of the Uniform Rules for Digital Trade uh transactions uh and i'm guessing you see we saw the release of the eu cp 2.0 a while back in time and the related urc the, the electronic uniform rules for collection how do you see the future shaping up for this bulk of rules and regulatory framework are they going to replace those old sets are they going to interact and integrate how to see the future coming for all these these rules and regulations yeah. <laughs> that's a fair question i mean people say why why are there already three sets of digital rules out there from the icc but we have to look at what they really are and the eucp <clears throat> is primarily for documentary credits and nothing else the urc is primarily for documentary collections nothing else so that's a supplement those existing paper solutions that are there the URDTT is not specifically linked to any product. It's an overarching framework for all products. Now, where will we go in the future? In my opinion, Andrea, Nirvana, the future, and it could be 10 years, 15 years away still, there will only be one set of digital rules. It won't matter if it's a letter of credit, an open account financing, supply chain financing, whatever. It can all be covered by one set of rules. But at the moment, that's not the way the market works. The market's not ready for it. They want these individual sets of rules linked to their individual types of uh, solution. It's not ideal, but we have to start somewhere. Wonderful, Dave. Uh, you anticipated a little, you see my next question, maybe uh, regarding, you see the products for trade finance. We know very well what they are. You see there's credits, guarantees. It's going to be a new, new standards. We're talking about standards as well. How do you see as uh, you see, progressing time, the interaction with ISO 20 or 22. Suppose that we had meetings, even with the SIGs, you see about DLPC and ISO 20 or 22 last year. 
it's going to come. So how do you see the interaction with this? Okay. We're talking about we're talking about digital payments in the end. Yeah, I mean, the, 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 I mentioned earlier about the ICC Digital Services Initiative. They are specifically looking at standards, very, very in depth. In fact, they have a standards toolkit already out in the market, which you can also download free of charge from the ICC website. And they've identified something like a hundred different standards that can be used in trade finance. So the idea is to make sure that all of these are interoperable and make sure they can work together. So this is ongoing work, Andrea, but it's not been forgotten at all. Uh, it's very, very high on the agenda. The thing we have to do, I mean, we all know this, because it's been said now for three, four, five years, we're in a world of digital islands. Um, because There are so many digital solutions out there, but so many of them don't talk to each other. They don't interoperate. Now, that's OK for if we talk to a corporate, a multinational, they don't mind onboarding lots of different solutions. They do that already. But you can't expect an SME to do that. They have to, if they onboard, if they take on one, one solution, they have to ensure that solution can talk to their client solution. So this is where the standard side of it comes in. If we don't have standards, they can't talk to each other. So bottom line, yes, Andrea, that's being looked at very, very carefully. And by the way, not just by the ICC and by, and by the UN, it's also been looked at at governmental levels and regional levels as well. I subscribe to your words 100%, Dave, and this is also my guess. There should be maybe too many digital islands. They should start talking to each other in a yeah. pretty fair, open way, otherwise we can't know where. So I think we can go ahead. I have another question, but I'll leave it for last, uh, David, just maybe for the closure. Let's go ahead, maybe Tom, with the, the questions on the, on the chat. Yeah, I think we answered Simona's question. If we didn't, I think that was kind of the last conversation. Yeah. Simona, come yeah. on back here. And our, what platforms are there where trade transactions can be conducted based on URDTT? And I think I've, you've mentioned a few of those. Um, you know, I've mentioned some, John's touched it as well. I mean, I, I don't want to mention any others. It would sound like I'm endorsing them. But be aware there are a number out there. The key is to get them to talk to each other. <laughs> is, 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 there a, is there a website they can go to? I think they can go to the URDTT website and there'll be a list there. Uh, at this stage, there is no list of the different types of platforms um, that can work with the URDTT. However, this the ICC commercialization group that I've talk, spoken about earlier are already talking to a number of platform and technology providers about perhaps endorsing their solutions by making them URDTT compliance. Now, that would be a very good idea because then we would have a list. However, it's very early days uh, on this one, uh, Tom. So that work's not yet been completed, but I expect something by the end of the year. So, so do, your, do your search on your favorite search engine or uh, go to TikTok. Maybe there's a hashtag there for URDTT on hit TikTok or something. Yeah. Uh, then you'd really know you've arrived. I mean, okay. Those platforms that are being proactive with URDTT have announced it on their website. So just look at their website, as you say. There you go. Good. Okay. Nana Praka, when will it have any impact on the structure of LC, comma, MT700? No, absolutely not. Um, the only place where ICC rules are mentioned on the MT700 are in one field, where it says these, these this credit is subject to whichever set of rules. So it'll be UCP 600 for paper or EUCP version 2.0 for digital. No, uh, no, no change whatsoever. Good deal. Okay. And again, if you have follow-up questions, just keep on pinging them, put them in the <laughs> chat here and I'll get to them. John, I see you're next here. You already got you, you got your plug in. So that, that's good. Yeah. Sounds like you guys are doing great work. Anything else you want to share? No, only that the having that listing of URDT compliant platforms would be really, really useful. I agree, John. I agree. So I, I don't know. I mean, the, the, the commercialization group, which, by the way, is headed up by Merlin Douse, who you may know from JP Morgan in the US. Uh, it's one of the things they're looking at. I'm, I'm helping them out with this, but uh, <clears throat> they told me it's one of their priorities. So I'm with you, John. It would be a great idea to have that. I don't know that gentleman, but if you would pass it on, I'd be glad to help. <clears throat> yeah, we will do. we will do. Okay, PD Pranuba Dewan, how can blockchain for trade be used for this as it will reduce the cost, time, and compliances in a significant way? 
Well, not for me to answer, probably better for you guys to answer that. I mean, the rules, as I've said, are technology and platform agnostic. We don't endorse any particular technology. We just know that blockchain or DLC is one of the key enablers for us to move forward. So it can be used, but it's not for me to tell you how to do it. It, it maybe a follow on question that are any of the implementations currently out there using, you don't have to say they are, are there any of them using blockchain underneath? Yes. Okay. Yes. Good. So that some are using, I'll give what, some are using blockchain, some are looking at Swift, and there's all different approaches, but yeah, definitely. Okay. Beautiful. Beautiful. Uh, let's see. Mufasa, you know, it doesn't uh, give me the rest of the last name. What are possible use <coughs> case integration? in our interoperability in adopting URDTT framework for national government? Great question. That is something, <clears throat> sorry, that needs to be looked at more closely. Um, if you downloaded the implementation guide I mentioned for URDTT from the ICT website, it will give you some, uh, some examples of case studies for supply chain finance. But what I would like, I think that's, that's a terrific question, by the way, um, and I'm gonna pass it on to the commercialization group. There must be a way that national governments can perhaps look at this as well. So I am not aware of any use case integrations at the moment, but it's certainly something that should be considered for the future. But do bear in mind, um, most international trade is not into government. It's between buyers and sellers. So, but having a government uh, also on board wouldn't do any harm. Yeah. For yeah, us at the yeah. moment, the only government interaction we have is getting them to change the laws to allow for electronic uh, digitalized transactions. I, I could guess there's probably some customs and tariffs and stuff like that behind yeah. that question. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Chirag, uh, how's URDTT <clears throat> different from URBPO? What went wrong with BPO? Have you got two hours? Um, <laughs> very, very, very quickly. You, you, you made my day, my very day. URBPO had a fatal flaw um, in that it was based on banks being the center of the universe. That's not the case with trade transactions. The center of the universe is the buy and sell. That's what URDTT is based upon. Now, you are being CC and the people that adopt the rules are banks. So the banks like to see themselves in the middle. I used to work for a bank for many, many years. I'm very um, But the fact is the BPO was too bank centric. Uh, furthermore, I don't think the marketing was done properly. The benefits were not explained to the market. Uh, regulatory authorities didn't understand the BPO, didn't understand where it fitted. Lots of work wasn't done properly. But the great thing is we were able to leverage upon that. We looked at the mistakes that the URBPO made to make sure the URDTT hasn't made the same mistakes. So we now have a set of rules that are buyer seller centric, which is where the trade originates. It also identifies that not only banks could be financial services providers, we have fintechs, et cetera. We have corporates even that can do that sort of thing. So it's in a different world completely. The URBPO very briefly fell because it didn't identify the problems properly. But a lot of good people did a lot of great work for it. And it did set the grounds for URDTT, to be fair. That's actually a perfect segue for the next question from Simona. When are the banks going to adopt the URDTT rules? <laughs> i tell you what, it's a great question. Now, this is also, if we'll go back to URBPO with this one, that was a problem with URBPO. As I said, I used to work for a bank. I was at Deutsche Bank for many, many years. I went all over the world with them. And uh, one of the big problems we faced in banking was budget at the end of the year. You're all getting projects, you've got, got your money. You're all fighting for, for money to do your business together. And basically, obviously, for the sake of the st stakeholders, uh, most banks went for the short-term initiatives that brought in money very quickly. Digitalization takes a lot longer. So unfortunately, lots of our stuff, took, we didn't get the money for it. We didn't go, didn't go forward. URBPO was one of them. The change we've got now is it's not the banks pushing the URDTT. It's going to be the buyers, the sellers, and the fintech providers that are pushing the URDTT. It's going to be the platform providers that are pushing the URDTT. The buyers and sellers in particular, the big guys, <clears throat> are going to end up forcing the banks to go forward. Now, to be fair, many, many banks are already involved in this. Uh, and as a commercialization group, there'll be as a dozen banks on there that you will all recognize that are working very, very hard to get this forward. So when a bank's going to adopt it, they're going to adopt it as, long, as soon as their buyers and sellers uh, want to move forward with the rules. And the likes of Consor, Marco Polo, et cetera, I said, well, I said I wouldn't mention names, forget those names. 
some platform providers are already talking to corporates and talking to banks about uh, moving transactions forward. So when are banks going to adopt the rules? A number of banks already have adopted the rules, but we still need to get some market traction here to, to get this forward. And I think it won't happen just with rules alone. This is where we need the technology providers. We need the legal regulators to move forward. We need the governments to move forward with us to make people be aware they can use these rules safely and beneficially. Cool, cool. Um, I'm seeing 15 new messages after this, so we're probably not going to get through them all here. So this is beautiful that there's lots of questions. I'll copy and paste and I'll send along to Dave and maybe we can do something in LinkedIn or something like that. Yeah. Andrea. Uh, sounds like the way to do it. So let's go on here. Eric Veliquet, uh, my counterpart is co-chair here. Another important initiative by the ICC are IncoTerms. Is the IncoTerms group looking to modernize using URDTT language? Good question, Eric. I mean, yeah, the IncoTerms are, are essential in this astral trade. They're great. Um, Bob Roney, who I know very well, he was um, the only non-lawyer involved in a recent update of the IncoTerms for 2020. And he's told me that uh, there's a lot of things that need to change. Um, are they going to look to modernize? I don't know, because I'm not involved in that working group. Should the URDTT become more pervasive, as I'm sure it will in international trade, then the INCO terms group are going to have to look at it. Um, whether it needs they need to change anything, I don't know. But modernizing, yeah, I think they're going to have to. Um, but I'm not involved in that particular group, so I can't say for certain. At this stage, I've heard nothing, put it that way. Okay, great. Thanks, Dave. Elizabeth Green has added a nice little uh, uh, part in the chat here that Hyperledger is developing a taxonomy of protocol standards, methodology, and certifications. Close to that. She has a link, so please uh, click on it as our favorite cool word, ontology, <coughs> in there. <laughs> man, an anthropogenic. Man, I haven't heard that word in the uh, URL, but that sounds like a great, <laughs> great idea there, um, Elizabeth. So thanks for uh, putting that in the chat. Michael Darden has a link there for us to look at too. There, that's the ICC toolkit on the standards. Very Beautiful. useful. Link. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Michael. Simona, David, are you aware of any competition for building a URDTT schedule standard step-by-step -step transaction process to be adopted by all? Well, it's not actually competing with anything. They're not standards. These are rules alone, standalone rules. The standards are being developed separately by different technology providers and by organizations such as the UN, the ICC and government. So there's no competition. Uh, this is just a set of overarching rules that can apply to any digital trade transaction. It's not competing with anybody. There are independent, neutral rules that give benefits to all parties. Okay, gotcha. It may, it may be even, I, you know, I might be reading more into it than uh, Simona has, has thought, but is there a hackathon or something along that where uh, you know, try, trying to advance it that way. That might, that might be behind that question mm. a little bit. So, okay, good. Um, let's, John wants more of this. He wants to do this webinar again. That's great. <laughs> Here. Thank you, John, uh, by the way, then, because uh, Dave and I, as I said, we're in chat, we're going to double this, this occasion, go for more, say in two days, Rick and I are gonna go for another meeting. Not on these topics exactly, but something related to this. So we're going to bring the flame of digitization more and more. So you see uh, on LinkedIn, I'm pretty active. So you see more announcement of meetings and chats like this one. It's, it's really important for the adoption is this great, great new uh, frameworks. Well, it's also very important for me being involved with the ICC and the development of these rules. I need to hear from people outside the ICC as well. So I need to hear what you guys are saying, because that's going to help us move the rules forward in the next generation. It's, uh, it's mutual, Dave. Uh, we're into this together. It might seem like it's hard to see, but it's not at all. So it's a joint effort. That's why we, you see, we at the start of the year, we had Thomas Kubiak from ICC delivering a speech about the ICC sustainability program. We're into that being digitization, one of the pillars of sustainability. So we we're we bring the flame of this, you see, with my colleagues, Rig and, and Tom, and more and more in the future. So stay tuned on each side. It's glad to host you, glad to have you between the attendants again. 
in the future. Of course, John, join us again and again for the future meetings. We're going to take pause, by the way. This is the very last meeting before the summer kicks in. But in September, we're gonna go, gonna be back. There you go. Any 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 last questions from our folks out there? Going once, going twice, going 30 times. Where's Gary? <laughs> Yeah. Gary's, Gary's got he's, he's actually a bit busy on something else at the moment. <laughs> yeah, Gary and I, are, uh, as you know, we work very closely together. We've got our own company together. So, um, yeah. He gave us some very nice work. comments. Gary gave us some very nice comments about our workspace, which we adopted. Yeah, I know. Payment obligations. So, thank you for me. Yeah, that, well, Gary and I actually um, shared information on that as well. So, uh, yeah, I know, I know what he sent you. <laughs> By the way, also thank Don Taylor if he's still around. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, indeed. Met that, many years ago, a good man. Well, it is quite, I mean, Dan Taylor was one of the guys, together with myself and Gary, who have always been very proactive at the ICC in pushing this sort of thing forward. And as with any big bureaucratic organization, sometimes you hit barriers. But something like Dan, yeah, he helps break the barriers. <laughs> he's retired now, by the way, so... <laughs> Is there a reason, by the way, do we, Tom, that we don't use cameras? I, I you know, I, I don't know why. Would you like to see my smiling face more? I'd like to see everybody. <laughs> you know, no, no. yeah, there, there you go. Yeah. John, I normally use cameras, but as uh, Andrea knows, I've had problems with my internet all day and I can't even get my webcam to work at the moment. I almost couldn't even dial in. So my uh, service providers have problems all day. So normally you would see my face maybe next time. <laughs> we, we, the essence we, we, of the DDT platform is the visual communication between the buyer and seller. That's <laughs> 70% of the trust that's built. So it hinges around the camera. <laughs> I didn't want to yeah, yeah, yeah. you. That's why I didn't turn my camera on. You see, I'm such in a condition. You see, we're in a drought here in Italy, so we... It's kind of crappy in the moment, so I didn't want to spoil your day, John. Yeah. Seriously, kidding, yeah. you see. I'm always in camera, so no, no worries. I know it's visually very important. Okay, can, 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 you know, we're not going to enforce something here, but uh, you know, it's 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 great when people are show their smiling face, and it's always fun to see backgrounds. And I can ask Andrea about his pictures in the background and whatever there. So. Uh, you want to buy them, by the way. I can yeah, tell. <laughs> Chief, I didn't realize this is turning into a selling webinar also. <laughs> no, no, that's not my interest there, Tom. Yeah. I have other interests, and that's why I called for the meeting with I, David. I, go ahead. Uh, to close in style, let's say, the first part of the year, for us, you say, it's very important to stick to this kind of initiatives. It's pretty interesting. And it can open to, to very interesting uh, future days for us. Good deal. Well, thanks, thanks, Dave, for joining. And uh, someone has said earlier, thanks to me. I, I, I'm Andrea and Dave are the ones who coordinated it. I, I'm, I'm the host for today. Since Andrea was, uh, I think, in capacity today at the beginning here. I mean, we all, Andrea, myself, and Eric, we all work together here to. Uh, hopefully bring some good stuff and hopefully add some value in the uh, supply chain and trade finance space. And, you know, maybe a future session will be one of these blockchain implementations of URDTT. So with that, um, Andrea said, we're going to take a little break here in August when we all go off on vacation, or at least, you, at least even if it's in your mind, you get to go on vacation here sometime in August. And then we'll be back in September with some new and and fun things. I'm sure Andrea will be posting stuff on uh, our LinkedIn uh, site for our group, and hopefully we'll get the wiki going also. Alicia's going to help us with that. Thank you, uh, so that we can use that a little bit more. And uh, if you haven't heard, I'll remember there's the Global Forum for the Hyperledger, for Hyperledger in Dublin, Ireland, uh, in the early part of September, and I'm sure there's still uh, available tickets and openings there then i you know suspect the, at least the initial look that i went through uh, looked like there were some really good sessions including ones around our topics so with that andrea eric anything else you want to share before we close out no i wanted just to thank you uh eric for being with us today alicia as well you see she's a great addition to the group 
Thanks, Dave, by the way, for this insightful meeting. It was, uh, it was a pleasure to work with Amy in setting this up. And thanks again. See you very soon in September. Yeah, I thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you. You're welcome, Dave. Thank you so much. And the best wishes from the Istanbul, Turkey. Thank you so much, Dave. Ciao. Thanks Hannah. a lot. Great to see you. Ciao. Oh, ciao. ciao. Thank you, Dave. Thanks so much. Okay, we're gonna we're gonna close now. Look look for this. Well, yes, we're gonna put some stuff out there. You can see the recording yeah. and the charts. This Thanks. is gonna be on my YouTube. I'll be posting as soon as possible the slides and the recording of the meeting. So you you'll see them on our link uh, LinkedIn site. Very soon. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the day. We'll see you soon. Bye. Bye. See you soon. Ciao. Bye. Bye, Dave. Cheers. Cheers.